depending upon whom you ask. Final Fantasy VII Remake is either a triumph or a huge disappointment. With such a divisive title, it should be no surprise that I have a few things to say about it. This video will be a little different from my typical format. I'll be borrowing the gameplay footage for once since I really don't want to play this game again. This gameplay footage is borrowed from Longplay Archive. Please visit the link in the description and subscribe to their channel to thank them for sharing this. This video is for those of you who loved Final Fantasy VII R and don't understand why some people didn't. It's also for those of you out there who didn't like it and are looking for someone to commiserate with. I want to preface this by saying that this is all just my opinion. If your opinion is different, that's entirely okay. Please be civil to each other in the comments and try to make the discussion constructive. I would like to start by addressing the elephant in the room and point out that I managed my expectations for this game. I had been following the developing news around the game for years and totally understood what to expect. I knew it was going to be a totally different and new game and not just a remaster of Final Fantasy VII. I understood it was not going to have a classic ATB system. I understood it would be released as multiple games. Now, I don't want to get into a whole discussion about what the word remake is supposed to mean. The title is the title, no matter how we feel about it. They're not going to change it. It's a terrible title to begin with, it's very lazy. Early in the development, it was stated by the press that Tetsuno Nomura had, uh, had, uh, had made Final Fantasy VII Remake a working title. Right? It was, it's Final Fantasy VII Remake, we'll figure out what the real title is going to be as we get closer to launch. But they just never got to that step, they never changed it. Which again, it just, it's very, very lazy. On top of that, they gave this, this title only to the first game in a series of games, which really boxes them in on what they could do to name the future titles. I still don't know how they're going to handle that. They could have called this Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Chapter 1, or Final Fantasy VII Return to Midgar, but instead they simply slapped the Final Fantasy VII Remake working title on it and left it at that, which caused a lot of consumer confusion. A lot of people didn't understand this was going to be multiple games, and were disappointed when they found out. Now, I just gave out two suggestions for a name here. They're not even paying me for that. They actually paid somebody to make that decision, to say, we're just going to call this Final Fantasy VII Remake. Someone got paid for that. Money. Like currency. Like they paid their mortgage with it. So in a lot of Final Fantasy groups and forums today, fans still ask, is the rest of the story going to be DLC? Is it going to be free? When is the full game going to be released? Just confusion over this poor choice of name. So to clarify now for those of you who don't know, the rest of the story is going to be released as full retail games. You're paying full price for each piece of this story. Now, I understood and accepted this before buying the first part, and I 100% understand that Final Fantasy VII R by itself is not the entire story of Final Fantasy VII, but it is by itself a full game. It is a 40-hour game with 100 gig of data. That's a full game by any metric, even if it only tells a small part of the original story. So that leads to a lot of speculation, right? Like, how many parts are there going to be? Where does the next part end? For that matter, do we even know for sure where the next part begins? I mean, we all assume it's going to be calm, but spoiler alert here, if you pay any attention to the way FF7R ended, that's not necessarily going to be the case. It's pretty clear that they've changed a lot about the story. Uh, so just how much is going to change, it's really still anyone's guess. Nomura has stated that they will be sticking very closely to the original story from here on out, but then later he said that he wasn't. More recently, they're saying that they're not going to stick to the original story. More recently, Nomura and Ko came out saying that this is not even really a remake or a reboot. This is actually the next chapter in the compilation, which sucks anyway. So what does that mean? That means that every event that happens in 7R is a continuation of the events that already took place because of womp womp a time paradox obviously because there's no other explanation that's going to make any sense so what do they do they put time travel nonsense into it and now it's like an alternate timeline of the original game but it's still related to the original game and it's related to that bs nonsense compilation that they came out 
I'm sorry if you like the compilation, but that was straight up trash. Let's get this train back on the rails. I think it's really obvious what Square Enix is doing here. As much as they as much as they've mangled this storyline, I think it's obvious what they're doing. And I also think it's really brilliant. I don't think that Final Fantasy Fantasy VII Remake was supposed to be a remake of Final Fantasy VII. I think it's an attempt to turn Final Fantasy VII into a money-making franchise of its own. And the compilation kind of was that, right? Like The compilation was taking this Final Fantasy VII game that was extremely popular and making it into a franchise by itself. Making side stories, making different games and movies and things like that. But the train kind of ran out of coal after a while there, and they only were able to take it so far. Now, there's an opportunity to start that up again. And this, I think, mostly came from, you know, that tech demo, right, for the PlayStation 3 back in what, what was it, 2005? It was a long time ago. Uh, I just remember the history of that, right? Like, that came out, that tech demo came out for E3. And you had fans frothing at the mouth. Oh my god, there's going to be a Final Fantasy VII remake on the PlayStation 3. Oh my god, where do I put my money? Tell me right now. And it never happened. And Square Enix, I think it was Nomura at the time. It might have been it might have been Shibata, I don't remember. But Square Enix's official word was, no, this was only a tech demo. It was just to test out our new engine. And no, there will not be a Final Fantasy VII remake on the PlayStation 3. Many fans were disappointed. Many fans were indifferent. Many fans simply refused to believe them and insisted that it was happening anyway. Uh, I was in the indifferent camp. If you want to know why, you should look up my video of uh, Is Final Fantasy VII Really the Best Final Fantasy Game? Now... When that never materialized, they made it pretty clear that they didn't want to do this because it was going to be too expensive. It's going to cost way too much money to update such an old game like that. And the way that that news read, it really sounded like they were saying it was a never thing, right? I know never say never, but it really sounded like the answer was no, we are never going to do that. We are not going to spend the money to remake a game we already made because it's just not going to pay to do that. I'm going to give you a second to, to kind of taste that, you know, move that around a little bit. It's not going to be worth it. We're not going to spend the money because it's not going to be worth it. Now, we know that Square Enix has had its fair share of ups and downs over the past few years. If you look at their stock ticker and stretch it out to like the last... I think it's like last like 10 years, as long as they've been a public, publicly traded company, it, it, it dips and it dips and it spikes and it dips and it dips lower and lower and lower and then it spikes and then it dips lower and lower and lower and lower. And they've had years where their stock was just, they're, they're, they were giving it away. And then a big announcement comes out and it, zoom, shoots up. And then... The games come out and they don't perform quite as well as they were expected to when it kind of levels back down again. Uh, since Final Fantasy VII Remake came out, that stock has been steady at around 50 bucks a share. And uh, I think that really tells us why this was done when it was done. This was done when it was done because they needed a hit. They spent a lot of money on a lot of games that didn't really pan out in the long term. Now, I know there's definitely some debatable stuff there because, for the most part, like, all their games actually do sell really well. Or at least they sell really well in the beginning. Like, they sell really well at launch. Because, let's be, let, let's be real, you could slap the name Final Fantasy VII on anything. You could slap the name Final Fantasy on anything. And day one, it's going to sell, especially in Japan. It doesn't matter what it is. People are going to buy it. Where they started hurting was... After day one. In the West. After localization. Where they were finding that. The long term sales of these products. Were not keeping up. 
you got a big spike of sales right at the very beginning because of the hype. And then as soon as people actually played these games and experienced them, and that hype died down, those sales leveled off. But I think that's debatable. Uh, you know, you can tell me in the comments if you found different, but I think that's the trend they've basically been going through. A whole lot of hype, a big spike in revenue, and then it just kind of levels off because they're just not making the big games they used to. I'm not saying the games aren't successful, they're just not as big as they used to be. Now, moving along, because I don't have the numbers to back that up. If you have numbers, give me numbers in the comments. Now, by breaking up Final Fantasy VII Remake into parts and creating an expectation that there could be multiple timelines, that opens up the possibility of producing endless content. More parts of the game, sure, but also side games, comic books, films, anime series, all covering the various timelines and the people and places of Final Fantasy VII, an extended universe from which they can sell you lots and lots of things is not limited to games alone. Think about Star Wars, right? Think about Marvel. Think about all the big franchises that are out there that are money-making machines. What are they doing? They're diversifying, right? It's not just now, you know, uh, Captain America comic book anymore because Disney bought up those rights. And now this is a little tiny bit of a tangent, but think about that. Back in, what, 2000, around the same time, I think that the tech demo dropped, right? Uh, around that same time, uh, Disney purchased... Marvel purchased the entire company of Marvel Comics. And I was very confused because comic books at that time were not that popular. And even today, comic books still really aren't, aren't a big deal. But those IPs were very valuable. And what Disney did with those IPs was made them more valuable. They made movies. They made a lot of merchandising. Toys, costumes, everything you could think of. You know, animated series, books... It's all out there. They're taking those IPs and they're turning all those IPs into money-making machines. And I think that's what Square Enix was trying to do here. I think they said, we have an IP that we know. We know this IP is valuable. We know we could print money off of this IP. Now, we haven't had a big hit in a while. The big hits that we've had have not kept coming. They're not paying off in the long run. And we need a slam dunk. I think that that was the idea here. They wanted a slam dunk, so they took Final Fantasy VII. They said, we're going to break it into parts. Instead of, instead of releasing one game that's going to sell real, real well, and then drop off, we're going to make as many games as we can that are going to sell real well and then drop off. Because that's what we know how to do now. Again, this is speculation. I don't have numbers to back this up, and I'm not a fly on the wall. I haven't been there for conversations between the higher-ups at Square Enix, and if I were there, I wouldn't be able to understand it anyway, because my Japanese is limited to good morning, good afternoon, and thank you. This is what I think is happening. Now, most of the speculation out there is that there are going to be three parts to the remake, and I find that really unlikely, because at the time of this writing, Nomura himself doesn't even know how many parts there are going to be, nor does he know how long each part's going to be. Believe it or not, three games was never officially announced. It could be two, it could be five, it could be three. There's no way to know for sure. It could be 50. I don't know because Nomura doesn't know. Nobody knows. You sure as hell don't know. Now, don't forget that a lot of content was added to this first game. It only covers the first five hours of the original game, but it stretched that out to 40 hours. Now that does include like 20 hours of pointless side quests, which seems to be something Square Enix really likes now, but nevertheless, if they were able to add this much content to Midgar, can you imagine how much content could be added to the larger world of Final Fantasy VII? There could be entire continents to the game world added. They could make an entire game just on content that wasn't in the original game. A whole new adventure could take place between Midgar and Calm. The Golden Source Saucer could be an entire game by itself. The next part could be 40 hours, or 20 hours, or 60 hours. A lot of fans speculate that the second part will end with the death of Aerith. 
This would make sense, but I think it's way more likely that it ends long before that, and that a lot of additional content is added leading up to that point. We already have new characters and completely new areas in Midgar, as well as significant changes to the story itself. There is just absolutely no way that we can be sure about what happens next. Now that we've talked about the speculation surrounding the game, I want to talk a little bit about the game itself. Since I'm going to have some pretty brutal criticisms here, I want to start by talking about what I really love about this game. First of all, it is amazing to see a modern interpretation of this game that I loved so much 23 years ago. I was 17 when Final Fantasy VII came out, and at that time, I totally fell in love with it, and I think we all did. And while I definitely do have my fair share of criticisms regarding that game today, I don't think there's anyone watching this video now for whom it doesn't have a special place in their heart. If you're watching this video, that game made an impact on you. Seeing this updated version of Midgar was really breathtaking and inspired a lot of ooh, ah moments. Even looking at the new Shinra employee housing area, it seemed really, really cool. It was this amazing blend of suburban sprawl with assembly line manufacturing machinery and urban imagery. It's just an incredible paradox, it's an amazing piece of design, and it has a lot to say. It has a lot of depth, a lot of content in that design. I think that has a lot of merit. In spite of the bad things I'm about to say about this game, from the standpoint of design, which Tetsuya Nomura is an expert at, this game has excellent, excellent world design, visual design. The materia system has a tremendous amount of depth here, and it really gives the player full control of how they want to build out their characters. It's much more sophisticated than the original system, and definitely way more difficult to exploit. Materia choices have to be have to be made carefully, and while materia is plentiful even early in the game, slots are not, especially with very valuable linked slots. Now, I know in the in the first game, it was supposed to feel. I'm talking about 97 now. It was supposed to feel like you could build out your character however you wanted to, but really, the way the material system shaped up, it didn't really pay to do that. I talk more about that in my Final Fantasy VII video. Uh, but here, that idea feels a lot more fleshed out. It feels a lot more done. The characters, they feel a lot more unique here in battle, and they all have their own special techniques. And each one works very differently from the other. Understanding how to use them takes time and patience and practice. Materia loadouts can significantly change the way they work as well, giving every character a definable role and a role that can be changed and molded to your specifications. It feels almost like an MMORPG in this regard with character builds and abilities being really important, and mastery of them is the difference between victory and defeat, but you have a lot more freedom here, there's not one right way to build every character out. Now, I would like to talk about some of the things that I didn't like, or don't like, about Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now, if you love Final Fantasy VII Remake, get ready to let me have it in the comments. If you didn't like Final Fantasy VII Remake, or don't like Final Fantasy VII Remake, I'm going to need your support down there when everyone starts coming after me. The ability to upgrade weapons and add skills to them seems unnecessary especially since there's nothing at all stopping you from simply taking everything from every weapon. The skills could be learned by leveling up and it would make a lot more sense. It just feels out of place in this game. It's like a little piece of Final Fantasy IX but not done the right way. Much of the game is padded out by side quests that while technically optional are presented to the player as mandatory, especially earlier in the game when Tifa walks Cloud around town making him do side quests. Not only did this part of the game make no sense at all from a narrative context, but much of the dialogue was aggressively cringe-inducing. And this is compounded later on when, with Aerith, the manic pixie dream girl who walked the cloud around town and, and, and makes him do side quests. And Mr. War-hardened ex-soldier just sort of goes along with it. I, I don't know, I guess simping ain't easy. But really, this is just one of the many ways that Final Fantasy VII Remake echoes your typical shonen anime tropes, and it makes it feel like this game was not meant to be played by grown men. It feels like it was meant for preteen boys, and I don't understand what market they're going for here. If this isn't 
marketed toward me, the person that grew up with Final Fantasy VII, and is marketed toward somebody who is just now coming into the age that I was when I played that game, who is this for? Who are they take what what audience are they taking advantage of here? Now on the note of this being like cringe inducingly shown in harem anime trope thing, let's talk about Jesse. Can we talk about Jesse? Jesse is obnoxious. She spends like three hours of the game following Cloud around like, hey yo Cloud, let me get that dick! I mean, I get the whole trope, the whole anime harem trope and the adolescent hero who inexplicably has every woman in the ensemble shamelessly hurling himself at him, but in 2020 in a game that I thought is supposed to be for people who are now in their 30s, it seems really immature and totally unnecessary. Is it so hard for a Japanese developer to write a character who is attracted to the protagonist without going into the anime self-satire, self satire notice me senpai cliche? Yeah, it is, but it's not these writers. This is bad writing. Uh, and a lot of the style of writing seems to just kind of bleed over into the rest of the game's dialogue and interactions. In a text-based game, I think it's less severe and less in-your-face you can ignore it. But here I just feel like I'm watching an anime for teenage boys, and not even a good one. I feel like this game was not made for me, and the sad truth is that it's simply made by people who don't know how to write for any other audience, and that's really tragic. Now, I know at this point, some of you might want to point out that this game shares some writers with the original Final Fantasy VII, and that is true. And that is sad. Could you imagine writing one of the most famous games of all time, and then 23 years later, being asked to work on a new vision for that game with a different director, someone who you worked with before, who designed the characters for that game that you wrote 23 years ago, and is now your boss, and is now telling you how to write the characters and scenarios that you already wrote 23 years ago. And that motherfucker is your boss now. And he tells you to write this. And he tells you, well, yeah, sure. You could write characters with lots of depth and heart and charm. Or you could write three vapid, empty shells that hurl themselves at the protagonist because it's a fantasy story for teenage boys. Now, Final Fantasy games have always had tremendous writing and a surprising amount of depth in their stories. The higher production values betray the weaknesses in the writing and directing. The staff that worked on this game don't know how to produce content for adults and it shows. This, there's only two possibilities here. Either these people don't know how to write for grown-ups, or they don't want to. If they don't want to, it's because they were asked not to, which means that it's Nomura's fault. Or maybe it goes above him. Maybe this came down from on high at Square Enix where they said, we want a slam dunk, we want to know that this is going to sell, and we know we can sell it to teenage boys as long as the big titty girl is shamelessly throwing herself at the protagonist. And here you go. Now another big issue I have with this game is the fact that the game world is so restrictive. A lot like Final Fantasy X and XIII, the entire game just feels like it's on rails. It's a series of hallways. At least you can backtrack and some areas are connected by multiple entrances and exits, but it feels very constricted, there's very little freedom. Maybe it's a design choice like Final Fantasy XIII with the idea of making the player feel claustrophobic and box them into a place so the story can be told the way the director intended, but it has me concerned that the rest of the parts will follow suit, utilizing the design that, that most fans complain about in Final Fantasy XIII, and this is something that I think that a lot of fans don't really understand. You can complain about stuff on, on social media all you want. You can complain every day. You could put a post on Twitter or whatever every day and you could tag everybody at Square Enix in those posts every day and tell them how shitty their game is and how bad their design is and how much you hate it. But you bought it. You spent your money. They have your money. They don't care. They don't care what you have to say about it. They don't care what you think about it. They care that you bought it. 
and they know you're going to buy the next one. It doesn't matter how much you complain about it. So you can have millions of fans complaining about how Final Fantasy XIII was a hallway. They don't care because you bought it. And the sales figures on that game are very good. So they're going to do the same thing. And that's what any company that wants to make money is going to do. If something sells well, they're going to keep on doing it. They don't care what you say on social media. They care that you bought it. And again, they're confident you're going to buy the next one. Let's get this train back on the rails. Regarding the design, I was really surprised and confused when I arrived in Sector 7 slums and there was daylight. There was absolutely no daylight at all in Midgar in the original game, and this was for a reason. And this is where I talk about how the same writers are writing a different game here and they're not writing as well. This is like... This is like Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, a classic. He also wrote The Lair of the White Worm, a piece of crap. Same writer. One was great. Later on, he wrote something different. That was crap. It's possible. It can happen. It happens all the time. It's had it happened here. They're missing a huge point. The people of Midgar are supposed to be oppressed. They're living under the plate. There's not supposed to be sunlight there. It's supposed to be dark all the time. They live in darkness. That's part of the world. The only exceptions are places where the plate is falling apart, like above the church. It's supposed to give you that that uh, contrast between light and dark. You're supposed to walk through this dark area where everyone's depressed because they're living in darkness all the time into the one place in the slums where there's a ray of light. The church is a ray of light. Aerith is a, way of, uh, a, a ray of light. It has meaning. It has subtext. It has content. The sun lamps completely kill the poetic and literary ideas put forth by the use of light and darkness in the original game. It's just one more example of the director and writers of this game not understanding the nuances of the source material, or in the case of writers who worked on the original game being told to ignore it. I know that the remake shares some writers, like I said, but they can only do what the director directs them to do, so even if a writer does understand the intention behind the decision in the original game, like the use of light and darkness now relates to the themes of the original story, the director may not, and he may instruct them to write differently, or may decide he wants to change the intention of the original work for better or for worse. I don't have to tell anybody who's been a long time Square Enix fan that Nomura makes bad decisions. But I'll go back to my point earlier and keep on buying them. Even the beginning of the story makes a significant change to the events in which it's clear that Shinra detonated the reactor to make Avalanche look like terrorists. This completely invalidates Barrett's redemption arc in the original game. It's something that didn't need to be changed and it only makes the story less interesting. I find a character like Barrett, who was very gung-ho, and he was absolutely without question an eco-terrorist and happy to be one, because he really believed that what he was doing is right. Later on in the original game, he realizes the mistakes he made, he realizes he hurt people, he realizes that people die because of his actions, he learns and understands why that was wrong. In this game, that's taken away from him. So who is Barrett now? He's a guy who never met any harm. He never learns, he never grows as a character. He never becomes better. What is his character arc? Where's that growth? A tremendous amount of the literary content of Final Fantasy VII has already been obliterated here. And I don't want to go too into detail because that would make this an even longer video. And we're at a half hour already now, and I'm still I, I still have plenty. <laughs> so, if you want a like a really deep literary analysis into how changes in the script have ignored all the literary value of the original game, let me know in the comments. I'll consider it for a future release. I would love to talk about some of these things. I have a lot of opinions, and I love talking about them. If you want to hear them. You can have them. <laughs> but let me know in the comments if you want to hear a little more editorial on this game and on the original Final Fantasy VII, my feelings, my thoughts, then please let me know in the comments. Um, the encouragement will get me there. Uh, now, I want to just kind of go on a little bit of a sidetrack here. I am ad libbing a lot during this video. I did major in English in college, so I did a lot of literary analysis. Uh, so this would not be coming from just some guy who wants to say things. I do have some 
formal training education in dissecting a piece of literature. And I'm going to treat, in this case, games like literature, because they are in many ways. And taking it apart and looking at the pieces of it and figuring out what they mean. Or what the intention of the author may have been. Or what themes can be extracted and pulled from that. And I can, you know, explain things and why I see them the way that I do. Finally, though. Last point. Let's talk about the fighting in this game. Now, I totally understand that Square Enix has spent the last 16 years trying to get away from ATB and all forms of turn-based combat. I don't understand why, but I do understand that the Final Fantasy series in particular has been a focus of this movement. It doesn't matter that it's worse <laughs> in, in every, almost every iteration, right? I mean, look, it made sense, you know. It, up until, I think, probably, I think Final Fantasy 7 and 8 probably had the best example of, of you know, the, the prime apex of the ATV gauge. And then I think after that they tried a few more things with it, and then after 11 they decided that every game should be an MMORPG, and they just didn't know what to do with it after that. They said, okay, let's get rid of ATB. Well, what are we going to replace it with? I don't know. We'll fucking wing it. And that's what they did. So, I want to make it clear that I feel there's absolutely nothing at all wrong with ATV or turn-based RPG combat, and there was never any reason to get rid of it. That's what I'm trying to say. Fans never asked for anything new. Turn-based games never showed a decline in sales due to the inclusion of turn-based systems. At some point, some suit at Square Enix decided it was outdated and it had to go. There was no reason for that decision. There were no numbers to justify that decision. Just, huh, get rid of it. The entire cornerstone of the gameplay system of our most popular franchise Let's get rid of it. Could you imagine if another company made a, made a decision like that? Like... Like if Domino's Pizza was like, Hey, let's not put cheese on our pizzas anymore. Well, okay, what are we going to put on there instead? I don't know. And then every year they just like try to replace the cheese with something different. And every year it was not quite as good as cheese, like it was different and it was interesting, but they never quite, it was not cheese. Because cheese is what goes on pizza, and, and a pizza without cheese is like a Final Fantasy game without an ATB gauge. You getting what I'm saying? Alright. So, pushing forward and trying to innovate is important in any industry, right? Delivering the same experience over and over again is never a successful strategy, I guess, unless you make pizza. Even up until the early 2000s, each Final Fantasy title always added something to that experience. However, after Final Fantasy X, which had a much more traditional turn-based system, it was removed completely and never really successfully replaced with anything else. Instead, each Final Fantasy title has had a completely new and different combat system. Some have variations on ATB, but as we moved forward, they became more and more action-based. Final Fantasy XV was basically an action game, and Final Fantasy VII-R has a similar core system in place, although clear efforts have been made to improve on that system. This is good, because that system was poorly implemented. I make this point because ever since Final Fantasy XI, it feels like Square Enix have been trying to make their combat systems feel more and more like MMORPGs. First it was 12 with the Gambit system, which I think actually is pretty good. Then 13 gave us a single character we could control with AI doing the rest. 14 was MMORPG. And 15 once again a single controllable character with AI filling in the rest of the rules. I think some suit at Square Enix played EverQuest and was like, oh no, this is what we do from now on. But here they seem to have gone a different way. Instead of controlling only one character and letting the AI handle your partners, the player has to control all three characters in real time, but they can only control one at a time. The player has to control all three characters in real time, but only one at a time. Imagine you were playing a basketball game, and you had to play all five players on your basketball field at the same time, but you could only control one of them at any given time, and the rest would just stand around. It is a complete and total mess. While you control one character, your AI partners just kind of stand around being useless. This is particularly painful when positioning is critical. 
for example, during boss battles. Your partners just stand there and take damage, they don't even make an effort to fill their ATB gauge. Using regular attacks and some skills causes your ATB gauge to fill faster, but there is no way to instruct your other characters to do that. You have to manually switch to each one. So you switch off to a character to have them build ATB, and the character you just were controlling a second ago stands there being useless. It would make some sense if you could wait for each character to fill his or her ATB gauge and then give them a command. But if you wait like that, their ATB gauges never fill. You have to constantly switch off between all three characters. While you're doing this, anyone you aren't controlling will be completely useless until you switch back to them. Every fight just feels like a chaotic mess. It wants to be like an MMORPG in many ways, but it's like an MMORPG where the other characters don't know the fight and don't know their rotation, so you have to literally take the mouse and keyboard out of their hands and do it for them. It's like playing a multiplayer game that no one else knows how to play. A turn-based system would be worlds better. Classic mode was included as a compromise, but quite honestly, classic mode seems to be no different from the regular mode. I couldn't tell the difference. The only thing I saw different was that in classic mode, if you if you don't press any buttons on the controller, then the, the person you are controlling will like step forward and attack the enemy once every like 30 or 40 seconds. It's ridiculous. It does, the, 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 the AI makes no effort at all to fill the ATB gauge. And that really sucks because there's a lot of cool things you can do in these fights, but you have to micromanage everything everyone does, and it sucks. Overall, I think that Final Fantasy VII-R falls way short of my expectations. Again, this is just my opinion. Yours might be different, and that's okay. Ultimately, I feel like the remake, it just, it wasn't made for fans of Final Fantasy VII. It was made for teenage boys, specifically. Japanese teenage boys, I think in particular, and the Westerners who impersonate them, right? It is insulting that this game is even marketed to me at all. And I feel my intellect is insulted by the presumption that a grown man would want to experience such a weak, cliche, and immature story. It's bad writing. It is the worst writing in the history of Final Fantasy. Bar none. The NES games were written better than this. I will be buying part two. Now, feel free to discuss this in the comments, but please do keep it civil. I know that Final Fantasy fans are very passionate. You can tell that from this diatribe that I just launched through. I just complained about a game for 40 minutes. So please keep it civil in the comments. We're all Final Fantasy fans. We're all here for the same reason. We love these games. And if we don't love them, we're real passionate about the reasons why we don't love them. But that's the point. We are passionate. We have a deep love of the roots of this franchise. We have a deep love of parts of this franchise. So let's remember that as we talk to each other. Remember what we love about Final Fantasy and why it brought us all here. That being said, I do want to hear your thoughts. If, you're th if you think I'm being way too hard on this game, and you want to give me some examples of where there's really great writing in the game, then absolutely feel free. Um, if, you can, if you want to give me some tips on how I can make that battle system not totally suck, I might hop on the PS4 and give it a shot. But I want to hear from you. I want to know what you think. Now, I don't do a lot of these editorial style videos. Mostly my videos are basically kind of like retro reviews of older games. But for this one, because I have so much history and passion for this franchise, I really did feel the need to, to get my opinion out there. Now if you enjoyed this and you wanted to hear more um, editorial style videos, let me know, sound off. It's something that I could do a little bit more of if I know there's going to be an audience for it. Uh, and if you want to hear a little bit more about some of the literary pieces that I was talking about earlier, that's something I would love to do. For the literary part, uh, doing literary analyses of these games, it's something I would love to do. It would be a passion project, but I don't know if that's something anybody would actually want to hear. If it is, let me know, and I might try it out, but I need to hear it in the comments so I know it's worth doing. And that's all I got. If you actually listened to this whole thing and you're still here with me, I really appreciate it. It was very cool of you. Um, this is all my opinion. 
Uh, I know I'm a pretty opinionated person. I have a lot to say. So I really do appreciate it if you stuck with me this far. Thank you very much, and until next time, game over. <laughs>